Today's Shine Why is on electronic music synthesis uh, by Dr. R. Vijay Raghavan. He's one of the newest faculty members of the IFR. And what I'm going to tell you about today is how musical sounds are actually created artificially. That is using electronic instruments and devices. So I'm just going to play a very tiny piece here. Let's listen to it. So there were two different musical instruments there. Did you recognize what instruments they were? Violin, 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 and, saxophone. Violin and saxophone. That was very obvious. And I think these were recordings of a real musical instrument, somebody actually playing the violin with a saxophone. This is a piece from the movie Arman, uh, starring Amitabh Bachchan and Anil Kapoor. And we all, were, we all were able to identify these musical instruments. So. In the first half of my talk, I'm going to sort of describe you the science behind the sound of music in the sense that what are the characteristics which makes a certain musical sound sound like a violin and the other one as a saxophone. Now, what's the physics behind it? And then once we understand the basics of the sound itself, then I will go on and talk about how you can recreate them using electronics and computers. Okay? So, you know, there are all these different kinds of instruments piano, violin, saxophone, you heard two of them. There is also percussion. Here's a drum kit. And I'm, going, I'm not going to be focusing on percussive sounds. And I will sort of maybe say a little bit about them towards the end. And the reason for that is there is a certain characteristic of which all of these instruments share, which a percussive instrument does not share. And that is the idea of a musical note or a pitch or frequency. So when we play uh, a musical instrument like say a violin, you know, we say Sare Gama Padanisa or Do Re Mi Fa Sol Do, those respond, correspond to specific notes in the musical scale. And that applies to all these instruments. So I call them melodic instruments. They have a tonal quality or we sometimes say pitch. We can distinguish between low pitch and high pitch. And that pitch is associated with a physical property of the sound, which is the frequency of it. Whereas in a percussive instrument, they often, it's not true in general, but the kind of uh, drum kit I showed you there, they don't have a specific frequency associated with them. And I'll, I will give you some examples later on. So I'm going to sort of restrict the synthesis part to just these kind of sounds and also describing how they work. So what is this property which gives a musical tone a certain pitch or a frequency so that we can say it's sa or is it ga. This is the fact that these sounds have what is called a periodic waveform. So what I've drawn here is some signal which is very some funny shape. And it's repeating again. So you see this pattern is repeated again. But what is this signal representing? It could signal, it could represent many things. For example, when we hear sound through air, these are vibrations of the air molecules happening in the air. So these could represent the air pressure as it varies as a function of time. So when I'm talking to you, I'm sending vibrations through the air and they reach your ear. So these are the changes in pressure in the air at any particular location. So for example, at the location of this microphone, which is then converted into an electrical signal and going into the camera so that they can record my sound. So the same sound wave could also represent the amplitude of motion. Okay. What do I mean by that? I have a, a guitar here. When I play a string on that, the string is actually vibrating up and down. So this signal could represent the motion of the string at one, at one particular point along the string as a function of time. And that has a periodic nature. Okay. And as I just said, it could also represent the variation of an electrical voltage which is almost always uh, happens whenever we are using a microphone or any kind of uh, uh, sound recording system. 
because these vibrations in the air are converted into electrical signals in the, um, using the microphone, and then they can travel as electrical signals. And then you can convert all of these forms back and forth. So just to, when I, whenever I'm going to draw these signals, you're going to see a lot of these shapes uh, in the rest of the talk. All of the three equivalent descriptions are fine. You can think of them as sound waves. You can think of them as electrical signals in a, inside an electrical instrument. It's all the same. The important thing is that they have a periodic uh, signal, a periodic waveform. What did I do with my laser pointer? It's here. Ah, there. And the time it takes for it to repeat, that's the property which sets the frequency or the fundamental pitch. Now it turns out that these kind of complex looking waveforms can be broken down into some fundamental units. The simplest kind of a periodic waveform is shown here in black. This is called a sinusoidal waveform, or we often call it a pure tone. This is the sort of the simplest periodic waveform you can make. And then there is a, a physics or mathematical theorem which says that one can actually break this complex waveform into a sequence of such shapes. So obviously, if this uh, signal is repeating with a certain time period here, you want to use something which has the same repetition pattern if you want to build that up, right? But what you also use are things which repeat twice as faster. So here's another signal of the same shape, the sinusoidal shape, which is now repeating twice as faster as that one. Okay? You can also have three times or four times. So these different frequencies which are related by integer multiples. So that's called the fundamental. And then these are called the overtones. Or all of them combined are called harmonics. Yes? Same in the sense the amplitude is No. So these are all different frequencies. When I say same, I'm talking about the shape, like how it goes up and down. That particular shape is represented by the sinusoidal function. So amplitude could be different. Yeah, I have not come to the amplitude part yet. Okay. So, in fact, that is the next immediate statement is, if I now combine these four signals, where each amplitude of each of these signals I choose carefully, then I can get this shape. That is this idea of Fourier decomposition. You can break down a complex looking waveform, which could represent any <coughs> musical sound, say for example, and then break, it, break them up into these harmonics, and the important information is how much amplitude is there in each harmonic. Because all of them repeat with the same period, even though here there are two periods within the period of the fundamental, here there are three, here there are four, the repetition shape, the repetition period of this complex waveform is the same as the fundamental. So when we hear this, we actually perceive the frequency corresponding to the fundamental. And the overtones, give the character of the sound. Can you tell us what amplitude is before you use the term? Ah, so amplitude here is, I'm just talking about how strong the signal is, okay, how loud the signal is. So the loudness of each of these different harmonics. So this is the basic idea behind decomposing a complex waveform. So you can have some other shape and that would just correspond to a different levels of volume of these different things. This is something like beta amplitude. Exactly, it is. So by changing the weights of all of these things, you can create any shape you want. It's actually quite amazing that one can do that, but it's exact. If you have a, a periodic waveform by choosing sufficiently large number of these, so I only stopped here up to four times the frequency, but you can keep going on and on, and then you can recreate any shape. Now. Since you brought that question, I should just also point out that when it comes to sound, humans cannot hear beyond a certain <coughs> frequency. Okay, that number is around 20 to 22 kilohertz. So when one is talking about reconstructing a musical sound, it doesn't make sense to include terms which are significantly higher than that frequency. So that imposes a natural cutoff to this process of reconstruction. So I like to now think about these musical sounds as just different shapes. 
Okay. See, this is the shape you are trying to create. Yes. And these are the components which you can use to make this shape. And the reason this, these components also sort of make sense because I can play each of these different tones to you and you will hear a different frequency. The pitch will grow as we go from here to here. So when you combine them together, it gives you a completely different feeling. You won't actually hear the four of them separately, but you will hear a sound which will be the characteristic of this particular shape. Which, for example, in a piano, looks something like this. Okay? Whereas, for a violin, it looks something like that. And a saxophone, it looks like this. So can you guess, say, between the piano and the violin, which one needs more harmonics to represent it more? Uh, Saxophone. Saxophone. Why? Violin. Sharper edges. All the edges and all the yes. So there are a lot more wiggles here and faster variations, which means that there are actually more higher frequency components, and that. You might also interpret that the, the sound of the violin sounds much richer. It's the tone of the sound. And it's these different combinations which gives you the feeling of a different instrument. Okay. The piano tone is often very soft. So let me actually show you some of these waveforms while I'm going to play such sounds. So let's look at violin. Let's hope this works. So you can see how the, the volume rises and, and falls down. So on the top graph is the same kind of waveform it's being displayed as the sound is coming out of this instrument. Okay. So I can actually freeze this. So you see this shape here looks a little bit different than what I showed you here. It's kind of similar. It's not the same. It's almost similar to it. It's because I probably caught it at a different instant, instant while the sound was playing. Yes? Why there is a slight difference on the light wave? This thing? Yeah. Yeah, that's some defect, something which has happened in the iteration process. <laughs> <laughs> Which can happen in a which can happen in a real instrument as well. So that's what's called a you know there's a discontinuity. So my guess is that since this sound was created by a computer, something happened. But these kind of discontinuities can happen. For example, if someone playing a real piano accidentally suddenly leaves his finger in an abrupt fashion, so that changes the the character and the, and the waveform immediately. And I'll sort of emphasize some of those things in a little bit. The bottom part here is the same information. But now in terms of this frequency content, see I talked about a waveform having all these different frequencies. And frequency here is sort of shown along this axis. You can see 80 hertz, 200 hertz, 500 hertz, 1200 hertz. And if you look carefully as I play, you see all those peaks there? 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are the different harmonics. And they're all of different heights. In general, you see that as the frequencies go higher, the height of these goes down, which basically is saying that the higher frequencies are weaker than the lower frequencies. And that also makes sense to some extent that the, since you hear the fundamental tone, that's the, the, the main frequency, the sound, when you say that this is sa or something like that, right? Uh, so when you associate the, what is the octave, what's the note, that is the fundamental tone. You hear only one pitch. So here you see that the, the lowest peak is here, this one right there, I'm going to go one octave higher, then the, it moved there, it was here. See? But the first harmonic of the lower one is the same as the fundamental of the first one, because an octave is exactly double the frequency. Now let's look at the, let's say, saxophone. This one looks very similar to what I have shown before, but down here you can see there are many, 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 many peaks, just like 
you get that the saxophone sound has a lot more harmonic content. And that's what makes it sound sort of richer and less soft as compared to the, uh, the piano. But what is that determines why a piano sound has waveforms like this while a violin like that? Well, that's the acoustics of the instrument. That's how the shape of the instrument is constructed, how the strings are attached to the instrument, how you play it. For example, in a, in a piano, you have a hammer which strikes a string, whereas in a violin, you use a bow. So all of these things change the way the system can oscillate and create these waveforms. But this is actually not the end of the story. These shapes do sort of uniquely determine the characteristic of a certain instrument. But what is also important is actually how the sound starts off and then ends. It turns out that that's actually sometimes even more important for us to perceive a sound as a piano or a violin. Now these are the same waveforms, but now have expanded time in order to show how the sound first rises and then slowly falls off as I play the instrument. So let's go back. I'm going to show you the... So I've just sort of zoomed out. Now you can see the waveform. So you see there's a very sharp rise and then it falls off slowly. If I do the same thing for a saxophone, <laughs> see it ends much more abruptly, but there is another characteristic of the saxophone sound that I can hold the note. In a, in a piano, you cannot hold the note. Once you play it, it will stop vibrating after some point of time. It's because you only hit it once. But in a saxophone, I can hold it. Till the guy runs out of breath. <laughs> and what's amazing, well, I'll come back to that later, that I actually did not leave the key. So this synthesis system actually knows that even if I try to hold the key here, a saxophone tone cannot last longer than a certain amount of time. I don't know whose reference they took to decide the time on that. I'll probably not be able to play it for even a fraction of that time. Holding capacity of the air. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but you know that could vary. I'm sure. I heard that you are a professional flute player, and uh, you will probably hold it longer than someone who has just started learning. So, this idea of the rise and then the sound remaining at a level position and then dying down is extremely important to give character to a musical sound. So here are three different examples again. You saw the piano and the saxophone. And then this is another instrument, the santu. Okay? The santu has a very similar looking pattern. However, it kind of rings out for a longer time. There is also another subtle difference. In a piano, when you leave the key, the string actually stops vibrating because the same, there is something called a damper. So that determines that when I release the key, the sound has to fall down rather quickly. But in a, in a santur, it's not like that because you just hit the string and unless you damp it intentionally, it will have to just ring down. So it has sort of a more resonating kind of a sound. But a piano doesn't <coughs> ring that much. If I leave it, it damps fairly quickly. So this is characterized sort of to make a model of this process is something what's called the ADSR curve. Okay. The shape here is sort of <coughs> approximating in general how the volume of the sound rises and falls in time. 
So the first is the attack part, that is how quickly the sound rises. For most instrument, it's actually very fast. It's usually never very slow for real instruments. Then immediately after rising to its maximum volume, it might come down to a slightly lower volume. That also is rare, but that's called the decay phase of it. <coughs> but then you have this sustained phase, which is present in the saxophone, but it's not present in the piano or the santu, because you cannot hold the note there. So the sound can stay for as long as you want to play it, and then when you stop playing it, how the sound decays back to zero. So it's the combination of these two things which is the simplest model you can make to represent a musical term. Okay? So there are two shapes. One is the shape of the repeating pattern, which sort of sense the, senses the tone of the sound. And then the second is the shape of how the volume rises and falls. And that also gives it character. There are some factors which are not covered in this picture. And this is sounds which emanate from an instrument which are not periodic in nature. So they don't have a melodic content. However, they still are very important to make an instrument sound real. Or for example, when you hear something playing, we can identify that as something uh, like a real instrument. Okay, so this is the guitar. But there's something which happens when someone is playing a guitar. You hear that? And that happens when someone quickly moves his finger from one part of the fretboard to another part. And if you listen to any guitar piece, you will hear this sound. And it's actually integral to the creation or, or, or sort of associating a certain guitar piece. So this obviously is not a tonal sound and it cannot be included in this model. So depending on the kind of synthesis technique one is using, you can either include these effects or you may not be able to include these effects. The other example would be the sound of the breath while playing a flute. And I'm sure you can uh, vouch for that. That's actually very important. When you play a flute along with the tone, the, the fact that you're blowing into it, that actually gives you a sort of a background noise to the whole thing. And that's very important for a flute to sound like a flute. Otherwise, it will sound very artificial. Then there is the question of, can I just have one particular shape for a given instrument? You know, I sort of showed this characteristic shape for piano and, and violin and so on. But actually, it's not that simple. Because it depends on how you're interacting with this instrument. Whether I pluck this string in the middle, or if I pluck it all the way at the end here, you can hear the difference. It's the same note. Let's look at the frequency content here. That's the fundamental. Did you notice something interesting that the higher frequencies also seem to go down much faster than the lowest peak here? <coughs> That's another factor which affects the sound. But if I now play it all the way at the end, see that fundamental almost kind of didn't show up. But you had a lot of higher harmonics. In fact, in that series, if I remove the fundamental and I played you the sound, it will still sound like that. Because that whole waveform is going to repeat at the same rate as the fundamental would have. That's why they both, both of these sound like the same note, but they are actually different frequency content. So a single shape actually cannot do justice to an instrument, a real instrument, if you want to faithfully reproduce it. Okay? And then finally, there is this idea, there are boundary conditions. No, this is a scientific term. I'll just explain what it means. A boundary condition is like my finger pressing the string at a particular location. So if I, for example, let, I play this chord here. What I'm doing is after hitting the string, 
I'm just releasing the pressure on my fingers. And that stops the string from vibrating. It's because I changed the conditions. So this is also sort of not included in that model, but this could be maybe modeled by that DK fact. That if in the guitar, if someone is holding the, he has played the note, but he's holding the fingers tight, then you should just slowly DK. But then when you release the fingers, you should stop the sound coming down. And then finally, there are these effects called modulation. In the ADSR envelope, this part here, I have shown it as flat. But that's actually not necessarily true for many instruments. For example, let's look at a violin or a viola. Notice these things. They're kind of going up and down and up and down. And you can sort of see that here. There's a small variation in the amplitude, unlike the saxophone, where it was kind of flat. So this kind of variation in amplitude is often called vibrato, and certain musical players you know, actually use it intentionally, but some musical sounds have that character inbuilt. So you have to consider all of these things in order to make a sound, an artificially created sound, more realistic. Just a quick detour on analog versus digital. Since I'm going to be restricting all the synthesis technique on a computer-based approach, I just want to tell you because this is sort of a more of a recent phenomenon. What is analog? Analog is any signal which varies continuously in amplitude and in time. So like this particular waveform. And digital is not very complicated. Imagine drawing that on a graph paper. If I now break up time along this axis into these boxes here, <laughs> and I only keep the time at those locations where the graph paper's uh, lines intersect the waveform. And similarly, for the amplitude here, the volume level, I only keep those values where the, the horizontal lines intersect. Then I'm going to have discrete numbers at discrete intervals in time. That's the only idea behind a digital representation of an analog signal. The advantage is that now I can store it in a digital medium like a computer. So a digital signal is nothing, but it's discrete in time and amplitude. Your signal is just a sequence of numbers. It's just a bunch of numbers. You know, for example, this could be 0, this could be 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 0, and so on and so forth. And then you divide time also into regular intervals. So clearly, the finer the grid, the more accurate the representation of the signal. So there are some basic rules on how you should choose your grid and things like that. But once you do that, then it's just a sequence of numbers. So you can then store it in a computer, and then you can also process it. And the great thing is there are ways to convert it back into an analog sound so that we can, for example, hear it back. And that's how all computer sound systems work. The information is actually processed as a sequence of numbers, and then it's turned back into a real sound. So now come to the main part of the talk, which is how do you actually synthesize these sounds. So I've kind of already given you a hint. Okay? And this was this idea of breaking up this waveform into these many different uh, frequencies. So if you have a system which can produce this, 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 and this, and you can control the, the volume level of all of these differently, then you can combine them and create the waveform you want. And this is called additive synthesis. So you combine the different harmonics in the correct ratio, and then you choose the correct envelope function for the instrument you're trying to create, and there you have your instrument sound. Now this is the most basic and the simplest technique one can think of, but somehow strangely, historically this was actually not the first thing which was tried, even though this concept was there. And the reason was that to have electronic devices which created each of these separate ones, and for example, if you needed 10 of these to recreate a sound accurately, then it became very expensive and very cumbersome to actually have so many different separate systems for creating this. In a modern day computer, all of these can be created in the same program without too much trouble. So they actually use a different technique. It's called subtractive synthesis. 
Now here's an analogy of the difference between additive and subtractive. So additive is like building your shape using blocks, fundamental blocks. So here's like a little Lego building block thing. You use individual blocks, the sine waves are your different blocks, and then you put them together to get the shape you want. Subtractive is something more like chiseling a stone to get the shape. You start with a big block, it has everything in it, and then you remove the parts which you don't want. And then you create the shape you're looking for. So for subtractive synthesis, you use what are called harmonic rich waveforms. This comes back to your question you're asking about square waves. There are also other periodic waveforms. This is called a triangular wave, a sawtooth wave. And the reason we call them harmonically rich waveforms is that if I break these down into their frequency components, there will be many, many of them. In fact, very large number of them. And depending on the exact shape, they will all have slightly different amplitudes. It turned out that using electronic circuits, it was easier to create these. But you now only needed one of them. Because that one waveform had all the frequencies you needed to create a sound. Of course, you started with the period here, which corresponded to your node. That you could change. But then all the other harmonics were already present. And then what you do is you subtract away all the unwanted harmonics you don't want using filters. So just like you have a water filter, it lets the water through, but doesn't let the germs go through or the dirt go through. Similarly, an electronic filter will let go of the frequencies you want and will stop the frequencies you don't want. Yes, but the high, for example, all the ones above 22 kilohertz can be killed by one filter because the filters are also of different type. They can either say remove everything above 20 or you can say remove below 100 or you can say pass anything between 200 and 300. So these are called low pass, high pass, and band pass filters. So it's actually relatively easier to make filters it's because filters are passive circuits. And this was sort of the first really, the, the main technique which really set these uh, synthesizers apart. And the famous, uh, you might have heard about the term Moog synthesizer, which was based on subtractive synthesis, was the first sort of commercially successful instruments. Now this particular, um, Synthesizer didn't create very realistic sounding sounds. In fact, in the early days of synthesis, that was not even the goal. The idea was that these synthesizers, because now you can control them, you can create any sound you want. You can create shapes which don't exist in nature, for example, from a physical instrument. And they gave all these wonderful and strange and bizarre sounding sounds, which became very popular. I think Beatles and Doors and all of these people used it. And it became extremely popular. So in fact, synthesizers are associated often with these unrealistic, in the sense of you know, non-natural sounding, but fantastic uh, sounding things. Because you have complete control over how these things vary. Okay. If I wanted to do that in real life, I'll have to invent some very funky looking shape of this guitar, which might be able to do that, but that would be very hard. You cannot get immediate feedback to see that, okay, this is actually what I want. And of course, all of these instruments, their shapes evolved over many, many years with, with you know, uh, craftsmen perfecting the sound, but there they were not trying to create some bizarre sounding instrument. They were trying to create nice uh, sounding instrument. So there was actually a Google Doodle, I think in May, um, honoring uh, Moog on his 70th birthday. He's no more. But they made a little playable synthesizer just on their web page. And it had all the es essential features of the Moog synthesizer originally, which was probably very expensive and, and a complicated looking instrument. But now, because of computers, we can actually do it in very simple fashion, just by writing a computer program. But if I ask you the question, today, sort of aware of all the technologies that are available, what is the best way to make a synthesized sound sound like the real thing? Can anyone guess? It's very obvious, if you, once I tell you. But what's the best way? Yeah. Write a mathematical formula and convert it. Yeah, but mathematical formula, that's a good suggestion, but I don't know how to write the mathematical formula for something mm -hmm. as complex as this. Just, uh, record it mm -hmm. simulating. simulating is the same as essentially writing down the models. So basically, this basically uh, record the thing and then keep replicating. Uh, take the Fourier transform on the of sound from the original instrument and then reconstructing the sound from the Okay, but that's slightly a convoluted way. Why would you take a Fourier transform? Fourier 
as someone said here, you don't have to take the Fourier transform. You just record it. Just play it back. Yeah. So when you buy, you know, some CD which has somebody playing a piano, and you hear it, you hear the piano, right? There's no mistaking the piano for some other instrument. Now, this didn't, this wasn't very obvious back in the day because there was no simple way of recording something. So, for example, if you had used tape recorders back in the day where there was no computer media. And remember that it's not just about recreating the sound, it's about recreating the sound when I press something. Okay. So, if I, then you have to devise something where I, I will press a number, uh, key here and then the tape recorder should start turning. And then how many tape recorders can I have for every different note? But because of modern digital technology, sorry. Yeah, there's random access, and the fact that you can store these uh, information, the waveforms now digitally. So the simplest way of getting very authentic sound is just just record it. You know, get some good piano player to record the sound, and then you keep it, and then you can play it whenever required. So as I said, this is the most sort of simplest way of getting very extremely realistic sounds. But this is actually quite memory intensive in the sense that how many sounds do I actually have to store? If I store that sound, do I have to store this one as well? You use a base thing and then you say, okay, subtract or you take, take one up there and <coughs> double it and the rest of it. You use, you use both, you use the relationships that you know. And the you know you take one the first octave or the, the base that you start with mm -hmm. is taken from the natural instrument, while everything else is based on all the knowledge that you have of the relationships. So you're saying that you just need to record one, one example, example of the. Yeah. Now there were actually instruments which did that sometime in the past, but it turns out that that's actually not going to give you very realistic sounding instrument once you deviate from that note you recorded. And the reason is actually it's very simple. How do you increase the pitch? Sometimes when you had, I'm sure there are people here who have used tape recorders. I'm sure the kids have not. Uh, you know, sometimes the tape recorder is karab ho jata tha, so it runs faster. You yeah, yeah. hear the, the sound becomes high frequency. Yeah. It's because you're actually now playing the same back but faster. Yeah. That's actually the way you would change the frequency of the sound. So since you have it in digital domain, you can actually play it back slightly faster, and you can go from to a ray. But if you go one octave higher, it actually starts to sound not very good. Now with modern computers with enormous amount of memory, the best sounds are actually where every key, for example, say if you are trying to recreate a piano, every key is recorded or maybe one sound for every two or three keys which are close to each other. But the problem again is that can you can you recreate the effect of playing it louder versus softer? That's done because that's just changing the amplitude. But actually in a real instrument, when you sometimes play it harder, the character of the sound itself changes. Which means that the waveform shape has changed. So the even better synthesizers which use this technique, they will not only record that same note at one particular volume, but they will have separate samples for different level of volumes. So that way when it can actually respond and create that character of the sound. And then when you go to a very high frequencies on the piano, I don't know how many of you played a real. You can actually start hearing the wood hitting the, the hammer hitting the thing. And that actually is important to make it sound like a piano. Now in a sample based synthesis, that is fine because you just recorded the actual sound. But it won't work if I started with something lower and I recreated the higher one using the same shape. <laughs> so if you want to have dynamics, you need to have more memory. And all of that has become now possible because computers have become very, very powerful. You can, you can have gigabytes of, so for example, just this one piano sound could be worth several gigabytes of data one for every note, actually several for every note. And then you could also have other uh, changes and I will sort of demonstrate in a little bit. Okay. So for example, 
if I go to the sound of the santu. But sometimes santu player does this. I cannot I can't do that here that easily. So what they do is they record a sound which has that particular technique for every note and that is controlled by something else. When I say that okay I actually want to create that effect I have to push some other button and then play that note. And not just that there is an intermediate value where you just do it for a little bit. So as you try to make it to cover all these different basics of you know the different variations that are possible you have to store a lot of information but that's it that's not, not, not that's not something more complicated if you have more memory you can keep adding more and more things but then at some point it also becomes unrealistic to you know get the right piece of information and feed it through your system at the right time okay. but that's just dependent on the state of the technology 10 years earlier this would not have been possible to do on a on a laptop now most uh, people even professional musicians compose everything on a laptop because they have become very very fast and finally something which is uh, somebody else had suggested is to solve the equations and this is actually a real technique it's called physical modeling now this can in principle be described by a set of equations it's not very simple so often what you have to do is you have to make a simplified version of what a guitar for example is now often in physics there is this joke that the physicist's cow is just one big circle with two small circles on the, on the bottom <laughs> and this is something actually physicists do all the time we always try to make simple models of nature a model which is sufficient to capture the essential details you are interested in but it might not work in certain scenarios okay? so this is actually a realistic uh, technique and again you need very fast computers to be able to do that so that those equations can be solved because remember again I'm not trying to recreate the sound uh, by just recording and then allowing you to create the sound I wanted to recreate it when I press the key right then and there it doesn't know beforehand what's coming so it has to solve those equations and there are many parts to it and that's where you can actually cover a lot of ground for example there's the input stimuli you know whether it's a guitar I'm plucking it is it a violin am I bowing it where exactly I am plucking it, I have showed you there is a difference. That can be included in the model. Then you model the string. Now what is the material? This is a steel string guitar. A nylon guitar sounds very different. Because the nature of the material determines how it is going to vibrate. Mm -hmm. And again that determines what the frequency content of the, or the shape of that waveform is going to be like. Okay. What is the tension of the string? How hard am I pressing on the finger? So these are all can be included for the vibrating string. Then comes the body. How does this actually create sound? When the string vibrates, it actually transfers its, its vibrations to the body. Now the body, because of the shape of it, can only respond at certain frequencies, which is characteristic of this shape. Which means it's kind of like a filter. It will uh, you know, amplify certain frequencies, it might damp some other frequencies. So it's like you're sending some collection of frequencies which is coming from the string and then the body kind of shapes it and then you have to send it out how this vibrating body then couples to the air and creates vibrations and here you could even include details like well I'm going to record this instrument so is the microphone here or is it here or is it you know back here that will completely change the character of the recorded sound and that can all be included in the model and then the environment you know if I play in a big chamber like this there might be some echo yeah sir what is the shape of different shape of the body if it is different uh, classical guitars are somewhat bigger yes so what is the difference well the difference is that this particular body has what's called its own natural resonating modes so these are basically a set of frequencies in which this body would like to vibrate now if the frequency of the string matches that frequency then you will have that sound being louder okay so when you know it's like when you pushing a swing you have to push it at the right frequency this is essentially the idea of resonance okay? 
if you are far away from that frequency then you will not get a very loud sound now a complex body like this actually has many many such modes many many frequencies so depending on those how those frequencies are related to the frequencies which are coming from the vibrating string it will increase the or decrease the amplitude of the different harmonics which is now it's like subtractive synthesis right that's basically what's going on the string is actually giving you a fairly large number of frequencies fairly rich collection of frequencies and then this body kind of filters it and then there's the effect of whether the mic is here or there that will affect the volume it will also affect the frequency content to some extent and then whether the, the room you are playing is there going to be an echo that can all be included in these physical models well this is a real instrument it's not trying to artificially but yes the the way if I look at the the process flow it kind of looks like subtractive synthesis so that's a very good question the electric guitar's body actually doesn't play such a big role in fact the electric guitar's body is not a resonating body it is, it's not hollow mm. see because this is hollow it has these modes where the body can vibrate the electric guitar's body is solid and in fact that's the idea because you're not trying to couple the sound into air an electric guitar by itself will actually create very little sound because the string vibrates but a string is not very efficient at sending its vibrations to the air that's why you have a body same in the piano you have a sound board which vibrates and then couples to the air so in a in a guitar electric guitar there are these pickups which are basically tiny microphones which are positions right underneath the string and they actually directly sense how the string itself is vibrating and then that can be sent into your amplifier to amplify that but it can also be sent into a what's called an electronic processor and you can change the character of the sound yeah something is there at like when you uh, uh, do electric guitar something is there like that to control something yes what is that well that again sort of changes what you are doing for example if you want to apply a certain change for it could just be some, something simple as ha ad ad adding some filters and by pressing the thing you put some filters and that changes the sound so these are called effect pedals and things like that. So we have not talked about sort of three different, which are the most commonly used techniques of synthesis. The subtractive synthesis is generally used to create sort of bizarre sounding, you know, the kind of things you would hear in background music or horror movies, or you know, even in real music, something to give a different feel to it. It's a lot of electronic music which is created using these soundscapes and things like that. The key gets heated up. So does that also depend on the amount of wind in the room or in the place? You're talking about heating? So the um, micro heating, very it will be very, very little. I mean yeah. uh, in fact pressing the strings with your fingers probably causes more heating more than friction. than the friction of the vibrating string with the air. But the conditions of the air, I mean usually inside a room you're not talking about wind. But yes, if actually the air if the wind is blowing, there's a fan running, it will affect how if I'm playing and you're sitting there, it'll actually affect how you hear the sound. The room is very damp. That affects how the sound waves propagate. In fact, even it affects the propagation of different frequencies differently. So that can affect the nature of the sound. So often in a, in a studio recording, the, the studio is designed to be a very, what's called a dead space, where there are no echoes or anything. And then they, will, they can add these effects later on. So the environment actually makes a big difference on how someone perceives the sound. You know, it's like the difference between listening to a CD inside your house versus going to a full chamber orchestra and listening it, listening to the entire orchestra. The environment makes a big difference on the perception of the sound because it affects all these different frequencies that are reverberations from reflections and things. Yeah, all right, uh, welcome back. So in the last bit of the talk, uh, and then we'll open the floor to sort of more questions, is we've, it's about actually controlling the synthesizer. Uh, we have now different techniques of creating the sound, but then some musician has to play it, and to play it, you need some kind of a way to interact with your synthesizer. The most common instrument which is used for, in particular, for electronic music is what's the electronic keyboard. That's the thing I have, and the image you're seeing that is actually of this uh, exact keyboard. And sort of the main parts of this is these velocity sensitivity. So these, like, these are like the keys of piano. 
But what this particular instrument does is that it recognizes which key I press and sends that information along to the synthesizer so that it knows what to create. Okay. Velocity sensitive means that it can detect how hard I am playing. Okay. So not all keyboards have that, but you need that level. So this is where the first level of expressiveness, expressiveness comes. Okay. If all the notes sound the same volume, you will not hear the difference. So you know, it's like. So you need the ability to change the volume up and down for a, a musical piece to sound nice. And, and the instrument needs to be able to respond to those inputs. So that's so this thing only sends information on which key we press and how hard it is. This this thing doesn't know anything about it. It actually doesn't. I was I'm I'm just gonna to come to that. Um, so this particular keyboard, as opposed to this other keyboard here, does not have a synthesizer inside this instrument. This keyboard has the keys and a synthesizer built in, whereas I am using the computer as the synthesizer to control it. So this what is, is called a MIDI keyboard, but MIDI is stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Okay. That's the standard language these kind of electronic keyboards use to communicate. Okay. There's a whole library of different things. The most common information is what note, okay? is it a sa or is it a pa or c, d, e, f and how loud I have played it. And that's divided into a, a scale from 0 to 127. And then depending on how much, how strongly you press the key here, it sends the corresponding information. And then the synthesizer knows what volume to set. And all this has to happen very quickly so that you know the, the sound comes immediately after it. So that's the part of the synthesizer's job. So the first level of dynamics, which is what I'm talking about, is that now the dynamics here is the, the volume of the sound, okay, how hard I'm playing. But you need a little bit more. And the most common ones are what's called a pitch bend wheel. Now, that's actually not very useful for a piano sound, but what it does is something like this. Anyway, what a pitch bend wheel does is allows you to do effects like okay. instruments like guitars allow you to change the note sort of. The notes are not just defined by. You can do that. You can do that to some extent on the flute. You can sort of modulate the tones a little bit around the main note. And that's the most sort of commonly used dynamic input while you're playing. So there is a little wheel here, which if I rotate, allows me to change the note, go up or down. That allows you to add expressiveness. The next one, which is the common thing, is called the modulation wheel. And that can be used for anything. You can basically, a certain synthesizer might have different kinds of properties. And I already showed you one particular thing with the Santur, which was the difference between that's controlled by turning this uh, wheel modulation. modulation wheel on and off. But I can change, make that modulation wheel do other things as well. So for example, in a piano, you have something called a sustain pedal. Okay. This is the pedal when you press, you know, the thing we talked about damping when you leave the key, it actually doesn't damp it anymore. So then the string rings out for a much longer, more like the Santu sound. So that can also be programmed into the, with the help of another key. And there's a whole bunch of other sort of sliders and rotatory knobs here, which can be used for anything you want. So the MIDI language allows you a whole series of different controls. So for example, pitch bend correspond to a certain control number. The modulation correspond to a certain control number. There's something called aftertouch, which is only available in very few keyboards. That determines that after playing a key, what are you doing? Are you actually applying more pressure to the key or releasing the pressure a little bit? And those can actually affect the quality of the sound. But that I have not seen in any uh, keyboards, but that's uh, again a, a facility which is allowed in the MIDI language and certain synthesizers respond to that. But there are a whole other series of uh, ways to enter musical data into a synthesizer. And an example here is a drum pad. So I'm going to ask Pritam, who's a student at PIFR, to help me with that. So please welcome Pritam. So that's again an example of the fact that that instrument actually doesn't create sounds. 
it only sends information. So right now I'm activated the Santur sound on the synthesizer. So depending on what he plays, but this particular instrument is actually a very good mm. input device mm. for playing the Santur because the Santur is actually played Similar. with little mm. sticks. It has strings in it, but here are different pads. Mm. So if you map these different pads to different notes, so now you have to set which particular pads correspond to which particular note. A Santur is a lot more complicated, of course. But one can actually imagine making a device which will have that many inputs. It's just a question of setting it up. But you know, it's not a very, I, have, I don't think I've heard about uh, a MIDI version of the Santur. So let's now go to the drum kit. So there is no difference between really that particular instrument in here because I can I can do it here as well. Just the shape of that key is different. Okay. It's laid out like a drum because you're trying to play drums. Because otherwise I can play. I can play it here as well. And in fact, a lot of people do hmm. program beats yeah. using the keyboard. Because they might not want to keep all these different inputs. But this one does. So maybe you can look at this graph here while he's playing. Give me now one minute. Just play the bass drum now. Harder. Keep playing. Look at this guy. This is the frequency spectrum. Remember I said in the beginning that these don't have any tonal qualities. That's what it means. There are no identifiable peaks in that spectrum. There's no single frequency which is coming out. They actually send you a collection of frequencies roughly uniform. And that's what makes the character of it sort of non-tonal. Mm. But there are some drums which do have some tonal quality. For example, the toms. If you play the tom, a little bit. Maybe you can hear a certain, but again, you can see no peaks here. But for example, see the symbols, you can see a little bit of peak showing up. It gives you some hint of a pitch. But for example, uh, an example from our uh, own country is the tabla. See the tabla is actually tuned. Drums are also tuned, but mostly for sort of getting the right tension to get the right sound. But the tabla is actually tuned to a note. And that is sort of a difference. So tablas do have some tonal quality. So in fact, you cannot sing in a different scale if the tabla is tuned to a different, it sound very weird. And the physics behind that is actually the, that black thing in the middle. Mm. Yeah. That's what gives it the tonal quality. There's actually a very nice piece of physics behind how that black thing actually modifies. It's basically because a, a circular drum, when it vibrates, the different frequencies it can vibrate, they are not actually in harmonic multiples like a tonal sound could have. But putting that black thing in the middle actually makes them more harmonic. And that's what gives it a tonal quality. So, um, so that's you know, another way of giving input. There are also something called a MIDI guitar pickup or even a MIDI guitar. So this particular device can be plugged in to a regular guitar. It basically goes under the strings. And instead of recording the sound, it actually just detects <coughs> which how the strings are vibrating and it turns that information it's kind of going in reverse you take a real sound you figure out which note is played and you send that electronic to a synthesizer but the advantage is that now that synthesizer can create any note i can play the violin using a guitar i can play the piano using a guitar and why was this important it was because electronic music was sort of the sole domain of people who could play the keyboards so a lot of musicians who are experts at other instruments, they said, well, you know, I, I want something to uh, enter the music using my guitar. The other most simple way is actually just write music. You know, like back in the day, people used to write the music. You can just go into the computer and say this note, this note, and this note. But if you are a musician who likes to compose on an instrument and record the notes, then you would like to have a way to input that using your favorite instrument. So these MIDI guitars allow you, there are actually guitars which don't have bodies and are designed specifically for only sending these kind of information. The MIDI drums we already saw, and there's actually even a MIDI flute. You know, it looks like a flute. And the reason for having these different things is it allows you to express, you know, these dynamics of what you can do with the pitch bend, what kind of variations you can provide 
the keyboard is kind of limited with only a few knobs and sliders and you know you can't sort of do hold too many things with your hands but if you have a something which resembles a real instrument you can actually provide a lot of different dynamical inputs and if that synthesizer can respond to all those inputs then you can recreate a more realistic sounding sound or you can make it do something completely bizarre you know, for example when you do a pitch bend on a on a real guitar you could make the sound louder or do some other things or maybe even completely change the character of the sound so the moment you go into the electronic domain you can do all these different things which is sort of allows you to uh, to do a completely different level of creativity so it's not the creativity in playing an instrument really nicely but it's now using the new tool to create new sounds and new kinds of effect okay. and then in principle you can construct any kind of instrument if you want whatever your favorite is if it's a santoor or flute uh, and then make that send electronic signals but i think there are not um, these are the most popularly used ones in fact still the keyboard is the most dominant way of entering electronic music and finally the instrument player and the playing style also matters you know as everywhere you know the musician ultimately does matter um what i mean by that is because you are on a keyboard and you are playing some instrument which is not meant to be played on a keyboard you can do things which you would not necessarily do do in a real instrument you know if i do with the keyboard <laughs> not even recognize that this is a santu right but you know if i played something like so there is ultimately the the musician who also when it comes to electronic music how that instrument is played how the music is entered but you can say that well this is a new kind of a sound you know that that would sound perfectly fine uh on a piano on a piano it sounds very natural because you know that's the style of the playing or one of the styles of playing. so the music chain and how you input and that's why the different instrumental uh, different ways of entering data for an electronic music is important as well and you need to have give the ability to different musicians to express their that's the music in their own way and of course the synthesizer has to be able to respond to those changes and do the right thing okay so i think what this has really done is the ability to create this sort of one person orchestra or you know home studios so i read an article that you know ar rahman scored the entire slum dog millionaire soundtrack on this software the very software i'm using logic pro on his keyboard and the reason is it allows you rapid production you know you can do it very quickly and the flexibility i think is really the key you don't have to know a sitar to play a sitar if you understand what a sitar sound should feel like or how a flute piece should feel like you can use your keyboard to enter that music and actually create a completely rich sounding score and then the vast array of sounds especially with modern technology and sample based technology where you can record the real instrument you have access to some fantastic sounding instruments you know if you if someone just picks up a violin who has never played a violin he's going to sound horrible mm. <laughs> but if i play a violin on an electronic instrument it's actually very difficult to make it sound bad because the notes are you know you never mm. make a you never play a basura note mm. the note will not be out of key so it actually opens up i think in my mind it opens up the area of composing music to a much wider audience and allows for more creativity and you can quickly do something and then you see once you have finished the piece you can always say that okay i'm going to replace the violin track on my piece with a real orchestra or a real flute player because i want the extra level of expressiveness which i'm not able to enter right now but you can quickly make a draft of it but for example in ad films and i think i'm sure television serials they don't really use real uh, musicians anymore but you know does that really mean we don't need real musicians i already sort of pointed out that somebody still has to play the keyboard he has to understand he or she has to understand music and so this is sort of the last slide on can is there something called a perfect electronic synthesizer so i was sort of trying to come up with a graphic and you know i've sort of shown that you have a bunch of really talented musicians inside your computer and you are basically the conductor 
you're saying you play this and that person plays it in the best possible way and you know that's sort of the the ultimate dream of you know what you might have from a, uh, a realistic computer but is it actually possible you've already sort of seen the challenges there are a lot of inputs i mean is that the problem are there like too many parameters you know how hard i'm pressing how i'm holding the guitar what room i'm playing in to some extent all of these things can be input but at some point is it really worth the effort of doing all of these it's like learning the same instrument but in a different way okay. now in the future it might be possible that, you know you have all these different forms of input but it might be possible to use some kind of artificial intelligence now what do i mean by that see different violinists have different playing styles in certain cases you can actually tell oh it's actually this guy playing because maybe that person has a particular characteristic of playing a certain sequence of notes it might be possible that an electronic synthesizer can actually learn the styles <coughs> of different musicians and you will not only select piano or violin you will also <coughs> select piano by x musician mm -hmm. or violin by y musician mm -hmm. and you will only tell it the notes you want it to play but that might be able to to some extent recreate that playing style as well mm -hmm. but of course for that you need to get that musician in to your you know the person who's designed that software mm -hmm. will have to make the software learn and this is something that might be possible in in, in the very near future i don't know actually if, if people are if you're working on that entire over and then you put the cds in and you have an expert system which is that's right it is it is it is actually possible you're right it's actually possible without things happening also from the three different offered authors they could identify that she is the one who has written the Yes. So a computer program can actually recognize the style of writing. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. This is definitely realm in the realm of technology which we understand right now. The problem, slight problem with CD is that if you have a full orchestra playing, it's actually slightly complicated to pick out that one person. And also, when it comes to training, you might actually want the person to play a certain sequence of notes so that you can tell the computer a priori that you know this is what's coming. You learn that, and then it sort of slowly. uh incorporates that into its system to be able to recreate the style of the of the so i think there is in some sense there is nothing called <coughs> a perfect synthesizer and you can never replace the musician if you make something complicated enough that if a midi guitar has all the nuances of a real guitar <coughs> then apart from the fact that you can do it on a computer and make it sound different you still need to be a very good guitarist so you can never replace the musician it just opens up it's kind of lowers the bar or the threshold for people to enter into this and do a fairly good job and you know but you can never replace the experts or the maestros here let me take some questions so but that's basically the end of my talk so thank you i think you've already had but the thing is the, the, the keyboard might get spoiled in the bathroom so <laughs> yes uh what the possibilities are extended this for human voice um in terms of actually having an a computer sound like somebody else uh that's a very good question this is definitely a technology i think which is being researched on but uh this is not something i've been following very closely but as of now i think we have still not been able to recreate the nuances of uh, a, a certain speaker it's again like capturing every element there are you must have heard of all these robotic sounds which are you know which for example there's this auto text to speech thing in most computers these days but they are starting to sound more realistic but you can still figure out that it's not a real person but the question is can i say something and make it sound like you i'm 100% sure that this technology will come uh, this is uh, you know there'll probably be always some way to distinguish that it's not real but this is going to happen this is not uh, in fact the voice is uh, again an example of something called a subtract again the subtractive synthesis because our vocal cords which when they vibrate they create a very rich sound lots of frequencies and then our throat and the, all the nasal cavities and everything and the and the shape of our mouth they then form the the equivalent of the guitar body and they shape the the frequency content but again you know what is the problem it's too organic so when the voice is coming out every time there are many conditions which are yeah it's just physical state how Yeah, man, 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 man. yeah whether you have a cold yeah. whether you so drank a lot last night yeah. yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
but you see, see, in in the thing is, yes, too many parameters. So yeah, then you can always say is. it boils down to a computation power. But computing power has been on the rise. So if someone can make the problem is is actually to get the physics right in a in a simple enough form. You can sort of brute force do it, but it's to take a full orchestra playing and extracting what every instrument is playing separately seems like you know a, a human brain can do it. Yeah, if I decide I can focus just on the violinist and mm -hmm. figure out what mm -hmm. notes they are playing, but actually a computer program is still not very good at yes. being able to identify uh, these kind of uh, patterns. It's not frequencies, it's actually a pattern yeah. because you see the violin's could note is the same as the guitar's note, yeah. but mm -hmm. I can tell the difference mm -hmm. between the two. Mm -hmm. But a computer program is not able to really identify and this is again an active field of research and it's something which I have not been following in the recent past, but mm -hmm. 10 years ago I, I remember I was had a friend who was doing research on these kind of things. Um, to comment on the, um, the question you had asked about automatic pitch correction, <coughs> auto tune, you must have heard this term. It's become, um, I think it was created to fix problems in people's recording. So, you know, often what happens, studio time is very expensive. Singer comes in, sings, goes, and then you found that one note is slightly off. It's actually very straightforward. You know the frequency of the note you're trying to get, and you have heard the person's frequency, and then you just capture that and you adjust the frequency. It's almost equivalent to sort of speeding it up or slowing it down. <coughs> I think the technology, before it, the, it had to reach the level well, when you have to, because this is a piece in the middle, you have to take it out, fix it, and put it back in. And remember, you had caught that little discontinuity in my waveform. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem. If you don't do it just right, you'll hear a little kick. When, when that part comes. So that has now reached a level where you can do it for, but instead what happened was, uh, that was the main application, people started using it as an effect. Mm -hmm. you know. so, so real time now. How do you do real time? Well, real time is just uh, that, you know, the microphone is recording the sound, the signal enters the computer in the domain, it immediately analyzes and it fixes it. And then back to the speaker. But the problem with the real time, so that's where the, this effect started coming, is that, you know, when I'm correcting it, after the recording, I know which note yeah. was supposed to be played. Yeah. The computer doesn't know which note was supposed to be played. Now, in principle, you could say that, well, this is the song this person is singing, so you better make sure. So that's actually what happens, is that there is a scale. You know, or a, you, know, you can say it's a rag. You know that this note, all of these notes exist in the song, and this one, if it's off, then it actually catches that. And what it does is that, because these frequencies are at sort of discrete intervals. So if you <laughs> somehow lie in between two levels, it pushes it to the nearest okay. level. But you know, you have to be careful again, if someone is yeah. going <laughs> going in a sliding fashion, then you are going to hit all the frequencies. So that's yeah. where the... Yeah, it can. I mean, it can make it, instead of going continuous thing, it can make it discrete. So that's what this modern effect of, you hear this, uh, it's there in, I think, almost all uh, in the the song. Cher was the first Sorry, one who Cher. used this effect who, to Cher, share the singer. And now it's there in I think most Hindi songs these days. Anything which has some dance kind of <laughs> beat and song. Uh, what it does, it basically quantizes the, the, the notes the human voice can produce. And that sort of gives you this step-like effect. If you're going from sa to pa in a continuous fashion, which a human voice can do, you can make it go, instead of going continuously, you can go make it like sa, re, ga, ma, pa. You can sort of discretizing and that gives you that weird effect which uh, you're talking about. But the real time nature is just that you know you need to have something which can pr process. So yeah, the prediction is just you know the notes which are allowed in the song. <laughs> yes. So you are already creating supersonic sound which, which yeah. can take aggregation sound. Absolutely, we already do it all the time. I mean there are, for example when someone takes an ultrasound of a baby inside a mother's womb, it is an electronic instrument which is oscillating beyond what humans can hear. But those are also real waves. They do travel in the air, mm. and then they interact with the baby and they reflect, and then that's how you image it. Yeah. Why do different instruments make a different sound on the same note? Oh, uh, see, all of these here are the same note. Three different instruments. The reason they are same note is that the time it takes for this signal to repeat itself that determines the note. But the shape, the fact that this has a shape like this, but this one has a much more jaggedy shape, that's what makes it sound different. 
they have different frequencies in them and that makes them sound different to us when we perceive them you know and we associate those with of course uh, different musical sounds and uh, as i also said how the sound rises and falls also has a role to play in understanding or recognizing a certain sound as a certain instrument oh, is it because of the shape of the instrument uh, oh you mean why they are different in the first place yes it's it's the construction it's the physical construction of whether you are you know using a guitar and you're you know you're, you're plucking it or it's a keyboard and you you press it press a key or it's a violin you press a bow so all those changes how the different parts of that instrument vibrate and that gives rise to these differences you know both the how the sound rises and falls and also how the uh, the shape of the waveform is so man sings a song yeah and it is programmed to make it sound like a song yes <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is called pitch shifting. So, th so these all come under not synthesis, but in what we call effects. Okay? Um, pitch shifting is is very common. You can often the effect is not very realistic. It will sound like a higher pitch. You know that's what he meant. Usually, women's voice are higher in frequency and pitch. So you can shift it, and it will sound like something like you know a woman, but it will not sound very realistic. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like ah, it's like no coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is these things actually you can download, and this is also done for musical sounds as well. For example, uh, for people who sing with karaoke soundtracks, mm -hmm. you can actually change the mm -hmm. the whole yeah. sound. As you start to change it, it sounds the quality of the sound starts becoming bad, but yeah, it still it still works. But that's the great thing about MIDI. For example, if I have a song recorded in MIDI, <laughs> it does not include actually the the waveform. It only stores what notes are present. So I can easily just say push all the notes up by one and the synthesizer will recreate it perfectly. Mm. So if you have these songs stored in a MIDI format and then you have a synthesizer which can uh, recreate that, then this pitch shifting is trivial. Mm. Okay. At least better, not real. It will be much better. No, it will be real. It will be like I played all the instruments one note higher. It won't sound like one. Oh no, no, no. But <laughs> I'm talking about musical sounds. No, no. For not for uh, not for vocal sounds. Not for vocal sounds, for for <laughs> musical. Can you can you just synthesize something like here? We have been synthesizing all this time. Mm. But I will show you what the different the three different techniques I can show you how one actually makes sounds. Okay, so it's actually somebody's job to make these sounds, right? The synthesizer gives you all these controls, but someone has to tweak those controls and say that okay, these settings means it's a piano. These other settings means it's a it's a violin. So there are people who do what's called sound design. You know, I have a friend who uh, who actually learned that. And you know, when you press the button, piano and violin on a, on say a keyboard, you um, that's the what you're doing. Those settings are determined by someone who is playing with that instrument and then storing those settings and saying, okay, this is the best uh, settings for making it sound like a piano. So we will um, let me show you. Don't pay attention to this thing. It's, it looks very complicated, but um, so this is a, a software version of what's called the subtractive synthesis. Okay, so you start here with this knob. You see, I don't know if you can see. It. There's a triangle wave, a sawtooth wave, and a square wave. So you can choose one of these things. That's the first. So you choose sort of a, a waveform which is rich in harmonics. And <laughs> then there are these filter settings so remember you have to shape the remove the unwanted filters see as i'm as i'm changing the filter the number of harmonics which shows up here is the number of peaks see there is now only two you can see sounds different doesn't sound like a real instrument but it's a different character of the sound because our brain processes it in a in a different way now if i change this waveform you see a square wave sounds a lot richer than what's called a sawtooth <laughs> the triangle is kind of the softest 
because a triangle is the closest to a simple sign. The other ones have these very sharp edges, which means you need many of the higher frequency <coughs> components. So basically, one has to play with these different settings to make it sound like different instruments. So these settings are already stored here. So these are all synthesized sounds using um, the subtractive technique. So for example, they have all these weird names because these are all, you know. Uh, so this one is called sneaky synth. Doesn't sound like any real instrument, but you know, it's a, it's an interesting sound. Is that video game? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. When that when that character in CID serial goes into the jungle, maybe there's something like that. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, the pitch pad is working now. That's the modulation. So you see what it does for the waveform, it makes it oscillate up and down. So the synthesizer is actually responding to all the controls I'm, I'm providing. What's that song? <laughs> so you know that 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 lead part is probably not a real instrument. It's it's a synthesized mm -hmm. sound like that. So this is the subtractive synthesis. Now let me quickly show you the the sample one. There is not much you can do because it's mostly just the actual sound you recorded. But you can do some modulations. So this is the sample one. You can choose which particular sample you are using. So now it's a it's a bass guitar. just changing what you are choosing there. So now some strings. By the way, this is also something which is artificial. A real cello player cannot play two notes necessarily at the same time. There are mm -hmm. some ways to do that. Mm -hmm. But on a keyboard, I can, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these synthesizers will actually restrict those things depending on how realistic they want to make it. Mm -hmm. So in certain instruments, you cannot play two notes at the same time. So those things can all be entered. And then finally, the physical model. <coughs> this one is kind of uh, interesting. So this is the physical model. So this green line here is sort of representing a string. So that's the starting point of the model. You have a vibrating string. And there are these vertical connections here, which are actually the location of the pickups. So it's kind of saying that it's like an electric guitar. I'm going to pick up the sound at these different locations. And there are two of them. They are both combined. So that will actually add to uh, the variety of the sound. You can also decide where you're actually plucking the instrument. You see, by moving this slider back and forth, it decides where you're plucking the instrument. So for example. See, changes the nature of the sound depending on where you click. And then here you choose the material of the string. Oh, there it's vibrating now. So this corner is supposed to be glass like. I don't know, have anyone seen glass strings? Yeah. But essentially it's. It's a steel. Nylon. Wood. So you can, so this is, remember I told you all these different parts in a physical modeling, this is allowing you to do that. And then finally, what's called the body equalizer. This allows the final filtering, which happens because of the shape of the guitar or something. So here you can choose different kind of bodies. Very subtle changes, because now you're just sort of shaping the, the different frequencies differently. The maximum changes you see is in the, in the material because that changes how the string vibrates and of course where I pluck the string.
Yes, so tabla sounds are best synthesized using um, sampled sounds because modeling a tabla is very hard. Though I think uh, people did, there was uh, uh, Indian sounds, in fact, came very late to this art, uh, these kind of artificial because they're actually a lot more complicated. Basically, you can record the different bowls onto different keys. So it's a restrictive set, but if you have enough of those, you can actually create a nice tabla loop from that. Yeah, so this this is done at some tuning level, but so I can use a pitch bend to make it change the tuning, but it starts sounding a bit strange. But you see here the the velocity information is used quite cleverly because yeah. the tabla also, if you hit it harder, the mm. nature of the sound changes. Mm. It sounds different when I hit it harder. Yeah. Okay, there is a branch of music which is very recently developed, known as dubstep music. Yes. So is it all done by this idea? I think so. Uh, let's see. I have some dubstep loops here. But usually it's uh, it's faster. But yeah, but I think you can play a dubstep rhythm on a real drums. But I think often they are kind of artificially fast because there's too much happening in that rhythm. But yeah, there's a whole sort of genre of music which is revolves around this artificially created sound, and then you know creating more sounds using these techniques. Yeah. What is the difference between a studio monitor and the other speakers like Bose, Wapdale, or uh, Opera? <laughs> Simply put. It's the frequency response of the of the instrument. So every speaker has the ability to create different frequencies with different efficiencies. So this particular brand of sodium or this particular model is known to be bass heavy. It means that actually it, it, the bass is the low frequency sounds are more amplified than the high frequency sound. To the best of my knowledge, a studio monitor is designed to give a very flat response across all frequencies. So that when you are composing and listening to the music, you get sort of a very unbiased kind of a sound. And then you go and model it. So there's a whole art called mastering. Sound mastering, sound mastering sort of plays around with these different, adjusting the different frequencies so that it sounds the best across on all different platforms. You see, people listen to the same music you know, in a really expensive Bose system or in a very bad headphones or you know, really bad mono tape recorder. And you want to create a sound which is going to sound reasonably good on all of them. So that actually involves frequency tailoring and all. And you know, for example, mastering it for a cinema hall is, is different. So often the cinema soundtrack is mastered in a different way. So that's what I understand that the studio monitors, you're supposed to get a very flat response so that you don't, um, you can then control which one you want to increase and then which one's more. Good sound and a noise. Is it a perception based? It's a relative or a Well, it's not good and noise. So there is, of course, even in music, um, there are certain kinds of music people like and certain kind of music people don't like. So like if I create using random uh, you know, uh, data, will it, uh, like initial people would not probably like it, but then over a period of time, would they like it? Well, so randomness can be at many levels. So the basic <coughs> distinction, for example, would be between melodic tones and uh, things like drums, okay, percussive, where then there's no clear frequencies which are being highlighted. So that can be also thought that the waveform is kind of varying randomly instead of having some nice periodic shape. That's one kind of difference. And you know, humans perceive these, some people actually like percussive sounds better than melodic sounds. Um, but then within the same melodic thing, you know, some people might say, I don't like classical music, but I like dubstep uh, or you know, it's, so that's a perception of, you know, how you interpret the sound. There are many more levels of complications. There are people who actually hear things differently than everybody else does. So that's a whole other field of how uh, the perception of the sound is. That's beyond the scope of uh, this talk and what I know in general. Yeah. Yes.
<laughs> oh yes, I completely forgot. So, um, yeah, yeah, you can. You, why don't you come and play? So anyway, the idea here was to show the difference between a badly created sound and you know a good sound here. So, the, let's play. So this is, um, as I said, this has a keyboard and a synthesizer built in. Most likely, the synthesizer here is based on the subtractive synthesis idea. Nobody can see this. So this is oh, a. Right. You know, the, in fact, yeah. okay, yeah, let, let them play the. Music. How bad it is. So what instrument? No. No. <laughs> Anybody else? Some, some play more, please. <laughs> Harmonium, strings. That's right. It's supposed to be a flute. Flute. Yeah. That's a sampled flute. In fact, it's, this is an Indian Bansuri flute. What is this? Don't tell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody wants to hear a violin like that. <laughs> so it's a huge difference. And th again, th this is subtractive synthesis, there's only so much you can do. And these the sounds I'm playing here are all uh, sample sounds, so real recordings with some modification. Okay. All right, last one. Okay. <coughs> Piano. Piano. It is now. Anybody else? You have a ear for bad sounds. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was supposed to be a guitar. A steel string guitar. Hey, he's got a guitar. Better, but not that great, actually. So, in fact, I've, the it guitar sounds. More like piano, the way it came down. Yeah, so by the way, remember I was telling you about these other effects. Let's see if you can hear that. So this thing is supposed to do that, the, yeah, the sliding like sound, and I have not figured out when actually it does it. So there's some some algorithm which decides that if I go from one note to the other note, it's going to. Yeah, I hope 